All right. Well, blessings, everyone. It's good to have you all here today. And um, today we're going to talk a little bit about cirrhosis of the liver. Acts 10.38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And so we see here how, you know, he was anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power. And he went about healing all that were oppressed. And um, so oh, he's our ultimate healer in everything. So it says here on Testimony for the Church 5, 443, Satan is the originator of disease, like it says here, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. There is the, a divinely appointed connection between sin and disease. Sin and disease bear to each other the relationship of cause and effect. How to live, 570, disease never comes without a cause. The way is first prepared and disease invited by disregarding the laws of health. It says some grow corpulent because the system is clogged. Others become thin and feeble because their vital powers are exhausted in disposing of an excess of food. The liver is burdened in its effort to cleanse the blood of impurities and illness is the result. So we see here a little bit of information on what causes. So what is cirrhosis of the liver? Cirrhosis of the liver is a serious progressive disease in which scar tissue develops in the liver. And you know, when I was younger, um, well, actually my thirties, I had uh, um, scar tissues in my liver but mine was caused because of Tylenol, Tylenol. I used to be like in frequent pain due to a lot of surgeries that I had. And I used to take a lot of Tylenol to, to help me go through the day. And without knowing that Tylenol is the number one um, enemy of the liver, it really destroys your liver. So if you want some pain reliever, um, do not take Tylenol. It's really, it's really bad for your liver. Is as a result, it causes dysfunction that impacts essential processes like blood flow, elimination of toxins and waste from the body, hormone levels, and digestion of certain essential nutrients. Studies show that the most common reason why dangerous scar tissue replaces healthy liver tissue include alcohol abuse, a history of fatty liver disease and viruses such as hepatitis, consuming a poor diet, genetics, or a family history of liver disease and having high cholesterol levels may also contribute to the liver dysfunction and risk of cirrhosis, and let's add their Tylenol consumption. Cirrhosis is a condition in which the liver slowly deteriorates. Unfortunately, if liver disease worsens enough to be considered advanced stage cirrhosis, liver failure, then liver cancers might develop. At this point, the condition might be fatal and transplantation is usually considered the only curative option for most patients. Lifestyle changes and natural alternatives can help halt progression and even reverse cirrhosis. And of course, they do not tell you that, but um, we're telling you. <laughs> so, um, so here are common symptoms of cirrhosis and some complications. So many don't notice any symptoms of liver damage or cirrhosis at first. Here are some of the most common signs and symptoms of cirrhosis and other forms of liver disease. And you know what? Like I didn't feel, I, you know, I didn't have that I had a liver problem, those scar tissues in my liver until I actually started feeling pain on my liver. And a lot of people said, but you, know, so you don't actually feel no pain. In your, but I did. I felt uh, pain in my liver. And that's why I went to be checked. I went to get checked. And that's how they found out. That, that I had that condition. So if you have some pain in your liver, then you know that something is wrong. And the best thing to do is get checked right away because that's a sign that's already, something is already advanced. It's a lack of energy or fatigue. These are some of the symptoms, loss of appetite. Jaundice symptoms include skin and eyes that appear yellow, digestive issues like nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain and cramping, cognitive issues like confusion, disorientation and mood or personality changes swelling in the legs and ankles, skin problems like feeling itchy, urine that's dark, urine that's dark in color, brown or yellow, changes in weight, usually loss due to less appetite, tendency to bruise the skin easily. So this is some of the 
um, the symptoms that you might feel. So it says many ancient populations consider the liver to be the most important organ since it has the word live in its name. And I thought that was pretty interesting. It has the word live in liver. And um, it is one of the most important organs. <laughs> if you don't have a liver, you cannot live. <laughs> so I'm guessing that's why it's called liver. If you haven't been eating a vegetable-based diet, regularly getting exercise and making sure to limit your alcohol and toxin exposure, then just like most people, you might be in need of a liver cleanse. To keep your liver properly filtering toxins from the food, water, and air you come in contact with, there's a list of some specific herbs and superfoods that can help. Milk thistle. Milk thistle is very, very good for the liver. You can have it at tea or extract or even capsules. Turmeric and ginger. And some other superfoods include spirulina, croella, and wheatgrass. Probiotic foods and supplements. Dandelion root tea, burdock root licorice root, black seed oil, fresh squeezed lemon juice, extra virgin olive oil and coconut oil. And then you can cleanse and detox your liver by doing a three day juice cleanses and by squeezing a grapefruit and adding a teaspoon of olive oil. Drink it in the morning and evening. You can also do a coffee enema to detox the liver. It works very well. I have done the, the grapefruit and the teaspoon of olive oil and it tastes very, very good, and it works very good for the liver. So here we have, um, try to include this liver supporting veggies in your meals frequently, dark green leafy vegetables, steam and raw vegetables, or drinking vegetable juices, citrus fruits, sweet potatoes, bananas, avocados, which are great sources of potassium, cauliflower, broccoli, leafy greens like kale, spinach, dandelion, watercress, Brussels sprout or cabbage, celery, asparagus, beets, carrot, cucumber, and the herbs, including parsley, mint, cilantro, and basil. All those are very good if you uh, adopt you know, this diet and uh, implement all these nutrients in your diet, then you know, your liver will be um, very well. So over here, it says drink, if you want to do the, the cleanse, right? So what you're gonna do is, let me move this over here. Um, drink the squeeze grapefruit with olive oil in the morning on an empty stomach. Make a milk thistle and burdock root tea in the morning after the grapefruit. Make a turmeric ginger tea in the evening and then drink spirulina, corella, and wheatgrass juice in the afternoon. And to do a three-day cleanse in the morning, take two psyllium capsules, two senna and two slippery elm and before bed again, twice a day. Drink only liquids for three days, lemon water, herbal teas, coconut water, green juices, vegetable broth, distilled water. So this is for the liquid only. And then you can take two activated charcoal capsules in the afternoon for seven days. If not able to do the liquids only, you can eat a fruit platter in the morning and a salad in the evening and the fluids throughout the day. Then follow the cirrhosis diet. If you can do a coffee enema once a week for a month, it would remove toxins from the liver and it would be a great help. So if you have liver cirrhosis, know anybody that do have cirrhosis of the liver, following this um, regimen will be great for them to actually help improve uh, what they have. And Jeremiah 33, six says, behold, I will bring it health and cure and I will cure them and I will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. So God is going to bring us health and cure. And, um, and, and that is the main thing, knowing that God is our ultimate healer. And if we put our trust and our life in his hands, uh, there's nothing that, that we cannot overcome. So thank you all so much. And God bless. Amen. Amen. Hey, Sister Betty. Yes, sir. Is that, uh, that coffee? What, what is that coffee animal? What is that? <laughs> the coffee enema is actually it is a organic. They they do sell a special special coffee um, for the enema that um, I usually get from Amazon. It's very good, and uh, it has to be regular coffee, not the diet coffee or caffeine free. It has to be the regular, but it has to be organic. And there is a special coffee coffee for the enema, and it is actually very good for the liver. Um, I have never had like I've been doing you know. For, for a while and I never had any problems with, with my liver 
it's actually very, very healthy. Yeah. All right. So yeah, there is a special coffee that you, that you can get. Okay, appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. We are on one second. All right, yes, we're back in Revelations 13. We're looking at verses uh, 15 through 18 this, this evening. All right, let's have another quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word. Lord, we ask that you lead and guide and direct our minds as we study your word today. Because we're not the teacher, but you're the teacher, Lord God. So we're asking that you lead and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, our memory text for today will be Revelation 16, and he calls it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hands or in their forehead. Hold on, let me figure out where I want to put this book. Okay, so the first verse, let's look at uh, this question here I have. It says, the, the first beast that came out of the sea. Now, I'm, I'm talking about, if you look at Revelation 13, 1, he said, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. And co let's connect that to Daniel 7, 2. Daniel, chapter 7, verse 2, it shows us, and Daniel spake and said, and I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. So in verse 3, and the four and four great beasts came up from the sea diverse one from another. So there were four beasts that came out of the sea. Now the beast of Revelation, that's spoken of Revelation that came out of the sea, will be the fourth beast. But we'll see that in one second. Let's look at, uh, let's, let's identify, because the next part of this question is this. So we see the first beast came out of the sea and was the depicted by beasts of prey, while the second beast is depicted as a lamb-like beast. And then it says, among what condition do we see the first beast rising? And this is according to Daniel 2. So we see that the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. Let's look at uh, Jeremiah 4, 7, and 13. Jeremiah 4, 7, and 13. Okay, Jeremiah 4, 7, it says, the lion has come up upon his thicket and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make the land desolate and, and thy city shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. Notice he says, behold, he shall come, come up, as clouds and his chariots shall be as whirlwinds. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. Now we talk about this. This is a uh, when uh, Jeremiah was prophesying as this uh, as it relates to what was going to happen to the children of Israel because of sin and transgression, and he was warning them about Nebuchadnezzar. Let's look at uh, uh, Jeremiah 25, 32, and 33. Jeremiah 25, 32, and 33. 
It says, and thus said the Lord of hosts, behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation and great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. So you see that whirlwind is, and, and, and the wind stri strove against the uh, sea. All, all of these are, uh, this is trouble, fighting, commotion. Uh, notice in uh, verse 33, and the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Okay, let's look at another one in Habakkuk. It's the last, we'll look at, make that the last one as far as that. But the condition that uh, when the beast came up out of the sea was tumultuous, troubled. Let's look at uh, Habakkuk or Habakkuk 6, I mean, chapter 1, verses 6. Through nine. Notice here, he says, For lo, I raised up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity, dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses are also their horses also are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horses and, and their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as as the eagle that hasted to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind. Notice it shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. Okay, so we see the condition of the first beast rising out of the sea, according to Daniel 7. And then we saw... Uh, what all of this whirlwind and the commotion, it's just very tumultuous trouble. We see that there were many slain during that time of, of, of uh, striving and fighting and wars. We see the displacement of people. People are dead from one end of the earth to the other. All of that has to do with the wind and more. But we'll let that be the last verse for that. It said, what was the first beast that came out of the sea compared to in the book of Daniel? Let's go to Daniel chapter 7. So, the beast that came out of the sea, we're comparing it to this beast. Well, we, we can start at verse uh, 7. Let's start at verse 7, 8, and 20 and 21. It says, After this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It, it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Verse eight, 8 says, I consider the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in the horns were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. Let's look at verse 20. It says, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had that had had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. 
I beheld and that same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Okay. And Revelations 13, connect that back to Revelations 13. Now notice here, uh, I guess I could start at verse, verse four. And it says, and they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? With him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to make uh, unto him to continue forty and two months. And notice in, in 20, uh, verse 21 of Daniel 7, he says, and I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against, against them. And so he was given power unto him to continue 40 and two months. Let me see one second here. I think I had it. Okay. Now that's the next question. Well, according to Daniel 7, 8, the papacy could not only persecute the saints, but who else? So we saw in Daniel 7, 8, and then let's look at it here in verse uh, 24. My mistake. And the 10 horns out of and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. So we're talking about not only do he persecute the saints, but also these three kingdoms that were uprooted. It says, now I'm going to take this from Stephen Haskell. See of Patmos, page 94, paragraph 2. It says, the three divisions which, uh, which were plucked up were the Huruli in 493, the Vandals in 534, and the Ostrogoths in 538. A.D. Justinian, the emperor, whose seat was at Constantinople, working through the general Belisarius, was the power which overthrew the three kingdoms represented by the three horns, and the reason for their overthrow was their adherence to Arianism in opposition to the Orthodox Catholic faith. So that is why uh, they wasn't uh, adherents to uh, Catholicism or the papacy and their dogmas and the things that they were teaching. Okay. They said, what did the papacy think to do to God's law? Let's look at Daniel 7, 25. We, we should be still in Daniel 7. Daniel 7, 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hands until a time and times and the dividing of time. So he shall, what, shall, what did the papacy think to do to God's law? He thought to change it, okay? Troy, yes. You you said that that last quote you came from was from the seer of Patmos or Daniel the prophet? Daniel the prophet. Okay. Daniel the prophet. Okay. okay. All right. Because I know he wrote two books, the seer of Patmos and and also Daniel the prophet. Okay. So that was from Daniel, not the seer of Patmos. All right. Thank you. Let, let me make let me make sure. 
It was just talking about the Hareli when they over, overthrew the three, those three horns were plucked up. Okay. Uh, what was that? What what I say? That was a. Uh... You were talking about the three horns were plucked up, given the year or the dates when they were plucked up. Yes, hold on one sec. Okay. I'm just trying to make sure I get that. Hey, that's all right, man. We can get it at the end. We yeah. can get it at the end. Keep keep with your thought. I'm sorry. Hold on. All right. It says, how was the papacy able to keep control over the people? How was the papacy able to keep control over the people? Revelation, let's go to Revelation 13, 4. Because there was some there were some dissenters. Let's start here, but I want to take this thought from Great Controversy. Great Controversy 142, paragraph one, and uh, 606, paragraph two. Revelation 13, 4 says, says that, and they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast and who is able to make war with him. And it says this here, that prison, torture, I'm reading from Great Controversy, uh, page 142, paragraph one. And it says that prison, torture, and sword were weapons potent to enforce obedience. The weak and superstitious tremble before the decree of the Pope. And a great controversy, page 606, paragraph two says, and the sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of enforcing observances of the church by civil authority, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of papal power, all will be unmasked. So, basically, tyranny. This is one of the spirits of Babylon, tyranny. Another is control. Another spirit of Babylon, envy. It says this, what does the Bible teach about the image? About what does the Bible teach that an image is? Let's go to uh, Deuteronomy. Let's go to Deuteronomy 4.16. Deuteronomy 4.16. Give <clears throat> you time to get there. Deuteronomy 4.16. It says, Lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness, of male or female. Okay. Now, uh, in the uh, concordance, basically that's what image means from the Greek 1504, which is from 1503. From the Greek 1504, it says a likeness that is literally, literally 
statute profile or figuratively a representation or a resemblance an image and so that that particular uh verse pretty much fits the definition perfectly you see and, and the lord says let you corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image the similitude of any figure the likeness of male or female but it's also the likeness of other things but it's things to be worshipped basically that are not god okay so how would the united states make an image to the first beast of revelation 14 15 and let's go to a uh, great controversy well i'm gonna take this from this thought from the great controversy uh, page 445 paragraph one and two it says when the leading churches of the united states uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and i was thinking when i was thinking about that decrees i was thinking about uh that text that brother man sent me and uh what was that elder uh zephaniah zachariah zephaniah zephaniah chapter two verses one through three yes get that for me El. read uh so the decree their decrees and to sustain their institutions the pro uh then protestant america will have formed an image of the roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. The image to the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism, which will be devoted, which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. And as Great Controversy, page 445, one and two now so what does the beast with the two horns cause it said what does the beast with two horns cause all to receive okay and there's revelations of uh, revelations 13 16 and 17 but uh, that was uh what was that else zachariah zephaniah zephaniah chapter two verses one through three <clears throat> one other thing you got that for me Al? yeah i got it you ready ready for it y yes yes i'm looking at something else right. here zephaniah chapter two verses one through three gather yourselves together yea gather together O nation not desired before the decree bring forth. Amen. Before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Amen. And so that's going to be important mm -hmm. as we see and, and we moving forward. Uh, a decree is a basically a law that is given. Kind of like what we saw that happened during uh, Festival 19 when it first came out. Okay. Let's go to Revelation. So what does the beast with two horns cause all to receive let's notice it's going to cause it revelations 13 revelations uh 13 16 and 17 and it reads 
And he caused it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark, to receive in their right hand, uh, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So great controversy. 445, paragraph two says, the beast with two horns cause it. And in parentheses, that word cause it commands all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, I don't think in this study, I didn't see it. Uh, it's not really dealing with so much the number of his name. But Brian, did you go over that one, that portion about the number of his name? No, we did not. Okay. We didn't go over the number of his name. I was leaving that for you. I didn't want to go to too much detail, but I know you was coming behind me. So, oh. all right. So what is the warning given to those who receive the mark of the beast? In Revelations, let's look at Revelations 14, 9 and 10. Let's look at the warning of the third angel. So he's going to cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, to receive a mark, uh, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, okay? So if you do, and if that happens, this is the warning. God is letting us know. He always give us a warning before destruction. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any no man water. worship the beast, okay. No water. okay? If any man worship the beast, and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. So you're going to be... Uh, you're going to receive the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. And that's uh, that's going to be pretty powerful because uh, we can't hardly take the noonday sun. Let alone God's full wrath. So what is the wrath of God? Oh, Brother Troy. Um, yes. If I could just add, um, we were looking at the words cause. <clears throat> And yes. uh, from Zephaniah, you pull in the, the word decree. So I'd like to yes. give one more scripture. Uh, that's Jonah chapter All three. Right. Jonah chapter three? Yeah. Jonah chapter okay. three and verse seven. Ver picking up at verse six, but the, the key verse is verse seven. All right. There's Jonah chapter three, verse seven. Verse six and seven. Verse six and seven. Jonah chapter three, verse six and seven. And uh, so, for, for word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor bees herd nor flock taste anything, let th them not feed nor drink water. And it goes on. But the, just the point that the way you cause in the Bible, the way you force is by a yes. decree. Hey, man, that's, a, that's, thank you. Let me, uh, so, so in the last know. days when the, um, <clears throat> when the, um, the second beast causes the world to wander after the beast or cause them that would not take the image of the beast, the mark of the beast to be killed. Well, it's done by a decree, or in our modern language, you would say a law. Yes, that's good. 
Appreciate that. That was a good connection. Very good connection. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to highlight that in my own Bible. All right. Everybody catch that? A good connection to the decree that what, 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 uh, Elder uh, Mondegu read and uh, Zachariah, I mean Zephaniah, and then uh, Elder Williams connected that back to Jonah, which uh, we know that that was a, uh, a part of that warning that God had Jonah to give to Nineveh about their, their crimes and transgressions. Notice he sent the, was sending a warning through the prophet, but the prophet didn't want to go. And so that can't be us. Okay, so God is calling servants to go out. We got to go. Okay. Let's look here. Uh, let's see, where were we? What is the wrath of God? Revelation. What is the wrath of God? Let's go back to the book of Revelation. And this is why we need to get, while I'm going there, this is why we need to gather ourselves together before the decree breaks forth. So we got really got work to do. Uh, like even now. Revelations 15, 1 and verse 2. And Revelation, make sure I'm reading this right. Revelation 16. One and two. This is what it says. And another angel and another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having seven last plagues for them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire in them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. 16 verse one, and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worship his image. Okay. And it continues on. So we see and that's not the full extent of it because the end result is going to end up by it. Now, you notice that, you know, once they begin to pour out these vials, a lot of the things that fell upon the Egyptians, we see in the parallels and how God dealt with them and how the plagues were coming upon Egypt and, and a lot of things. And some of the, some of the plagues affected both uh, the children of Israel and Egypt. But for the most part, uh, those that affected Egypt uh, are, are the same types or the same type of uh, wrath except in Egypt God had mercy and the more God had mercy on the Egyptians the more they harden their hearts and so let us Lord I pray not be uh, guilty of taking advantage of your love even though we have it said who, who are spoken of in contrast to those who received the mark of the beast. Let's look at Revelations 14, 12, and then I want to look at a, a quote from Great Controversy, 445, paragraph 3. Revelations chapter 14, verse 12. And it says, Here is the patience of the saints, and here are they that keep the commandments of God, and 
the faith of Jesus. Okay. And this is uh, from Great Controversy 445. Since those who keep the commandments of God, uh, keep God's commandments, are thus placed in contrast with those that worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, it follows that the keeping of God's law on the one hand and its violation on the other will make the distinction between the worshipers of God and the worshipers of the beast. So again, we see how important all of this is connected to keeping God's commandments. And to be honest with you, this is why Christ had to, go, to come because his commandments have been transgressed. Uh, sin is the transgression of God's law. And so since that law had been broken and the wages of sin is death and God loving us so much, sin is only begotten son that Whosoever believeth in him should not perish. So God uh, gave us his word. He's given us the spirit of prophecy. He's given us basically all the tools and has sent his spirit into the world so that we might make it home. Okay? And we are doing a terrible job. It says, what is the, what is the distinguishing characteristics of the beast and of his image. Okay. I want to take this from Great Controversy uh, 446. Let me get a reader for uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. And I'm going to read this from Great Controversy 446, paragraph 1. The special characteristic of the beast and therefore of his image is the breaking of God's commandments. Only by changing God's law could the papacy exalt itself above God. Whoever should understandingly keep the law and thus, as thus changed, would be given supreme honor to that power which the changes, which the change was made. Such an act of obedience to papal laws would be a mark of allegiance to the Pope in the place of God. Okay, so in First Thess, what was that? I said Second Thessalonians. Yes. Two, yes. two three, and four. Yes. It says in <clears throat> Second Thessalonians. Let me get back out of here to that. Um, it says, let no man, sorry, verse two, three, and four. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Amen. And this is why they feel that the changes could be made. Let me read on. It says, the Roman Catholics acknowledge, this is from a great controversy, 447, paragraph four. The Roman Catholics acknowledge that the change of the Sabbath was made by their church and declare that Protestants, by observing, the sun, by observing the Sunday and recognizing her power in the Catholic cataclysm of Christian religion, in, uh, in answer to a question as to the day to be observed in obedience to the fourth commandment, this statement was made. During the old law, Saturday, was the day sanctified, but the church instructed by Jesus Christ, uh, but the church instructed by Jesus Christ and directed by the Spirit of God has substituted Sunday for Saturday. So now we sanctify the first, not the seventh day. Sunday means 
and now is the day of the Lord. And I need to read that again because I think I got something wrong. It says, Roman Catholics acknowledge, acknowledge that the change of Sabbath was made by their church and declare that Protestants, by observing the Sunday, are receiving, are recognizing, I'm sorry, her power. In the Catholic cataclysm of Christian religion, in, in an answer to a question as to the day of observance and obedience to the fourth commandment, this statement was made. During the old law, Saturday was the day sanctified, but the church instructed by Jesus Christ, which it was not, and directed by the spirit of God, absolutely not, has substituted Sunday for Saturday. So now we sanctify the first, not the seventh day. Sunday means, and now is, the day of the Lord. So in Great Controversy 447, paragraph four. Okay, so what law does the papacy claim to openly change? That will be the fourth one. Okay. The fourth law. And then there were some other things done to the law as well that uh to make everything fit but we're not going to go into all of that today so is sunday the lord's day is sunday the lord's day let's look at uh let's look at isaiah 58 13. isaiah 58 13. okay Isaiah 58, 13, it says, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord the honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shall thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob, thy father, for the mouth of the Lord had spoken. Okay. The mouth of the Lord. So is Sunday the Lord's day? Well, according to Isaiah 58, 13, he says that the Sabbath is his delight. Okay, not Sunday. He says, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on his holy day. So the Sabbath is not even man, it's not man's or Israel's. It's the Lord's. It is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It is the Lord's day. According to Isaiah 13. And there are more evidences of that in Scripture. Yeah, but, but Troy, also in the, the commandments itself, you know, when you go to ex Exodus chapter 20, and verse 10, okay. it says, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Amen. The Sabbath day is the Sabbath of the Lord. The Bible is very clear and so, so in plain. Praise God. So, the Sabbath is the day of the Lord. Did Jesus change the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day as it had been claimed in their cataclysm? Let's go to Matthew 5, 17. Matthew 5, 17 and through 19. Uh oh, wait a minute. 
Okay. He says, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so shall be called le the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So according to uh, what Christ has taught here in Matthew 5, uh, it says that uh, he has not come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So Christ never made the change. So somebody lied to us. Yeah, yeah, I've heard, you know, some people try to say that the law being spoken of here is like the law of Moses or the Old Testament or whatnot. But if you just look down at verse 21, okay, Christ says, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. So if there was any question as to which law or which commandment was being spoken of, Christ answers the question. If you look at verse 27, this is the same okay. conversation. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Amen. So it's, it's very clear which, um, which law he is pointing to. Amen. And that's the same law that Elder was pointing to in uh, Exodus 20. That's to say they were referring to the same commandments that were written by the finger of God on Mount Sinai. God wrote those, not Moses, by the way. But Acharya, I want to connect. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Huh? Of, I want to connect that to the Desire of Ages, uh, chapter 29. All right, go ahead and connect uh, it. The Sabbath was hollowed at the creation as ordained for man. It had its origins when the morning star sang, when the morning star sang together. And all the sons of God shouted for joy. Job 38, 7, peace brooded over the wall. For earth was in harmony with heaven. God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. He rested in the joy of his completed work. And that's Genesis 4, 31. Because he had rested upon the Sabbath, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Set it apart to a holy use. He gave it to Adam as a day of rest. It was a memorial of work of creation and thus a sign of God's power and his love. The scripture says he has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The things are made declare the invisible things of him since the creation of the world, even his everlasting power and divinity. Amen. Appreciate that. And that was the Zion of Ages. What was that? What, what was that in the Desire of Ages? What page was that again? Uh, it's 29. Let me go back to, um, I just, I can't remember. Desire of Ages, chapter 29, page uh, 20, 281. Okay, page 29, 281. All right. Next question. We're almost getting home. Uh, what is the sign of the Catholic Church authority or mark of the beast? Now we're connecting this is a, but I want to read something from a great controversy, 448 paragraph one. And uh, we're talking about Revelations 13, 17, and 18, which we've already read uh, those verses. But let me read this from great controversy, 448 paragraph one. As a sign of the authority of the Catholic Church, Papists, writers cite the very act of changing the Sabbath into Sunday, which Protestants allow of, because by keeping Sunday, they acknowledge the church's power to ordain feasts and to command them under sin. Henry uh, Tuberville. 
an abridgment of the Christian doctrine, page 58. What then is the change of the Sabbath, but the sign or mark of the authority of the Roman church, the mark of the beast? That's a great controversy, 448, paragraph one. So it is basically paying homage to a change that was made by men, okay? So we saw, we, we know clearly that the Sabbath is the day of the Lord. We also saw from what they said versus what the Bible says that somebody was lying. So I smell a rat, okay? So if we knowingly accept a day that has been uh, instituted by man and uh, by knowingly doing so, we are paying homage to the papacy. And when the decree breaks forth, we will receive the mark of the beast. But, but Troy, as, as you were speaking, it came to my mind that you know the devil always has a counterfeit right so the, you, the question you asked are you hearing me yes the question you asked was um like what is this what is the sign can you repeat the question for me and then what is the sign of the catholic church's authority or the mark of the beast all right so the sign of the catholic church's authority well, it must be in juxtaposition to God's sign because the devil always has a counterfeit. So, yeah. so, so if you just figure out what God's sign is, it would give you a better understanding of what man or the papacy's sign would be. And let me just read from Exodus chapter 31. Verse, All right. Exodus chapter 31, verse 13 and 17. Just trying to put, wrap our heads around well, what's God's sign. It says, speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Verse 17, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So I think those, those scriptures show, well, the, God's sign is his seventh-day Sabbath. So the sign of the papacy it must be in opposition to that. It's not, it's not the seventh day. It must be some other day. And, and the Catholics themselves say they're the ones who change the solemnity of the seventh day to the first day. Amen. So, and they say that that is a sign of their authority because they say that uh, the Protestants allow of, they accept it as true. And is it also under penalty of sin? Which is yes. which? Which is 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 so. Uh, I, I I don't know what the word is. It's um, uh, blasphemous because here they are changing the definition of what sin is. Sin is a transgression of God's law, even the breaking of the fourth commandment. But, but they say, well, we can change the day, and and order the observance of feasts under the penalty of sin. Hmm. Right, that's up. Uh... <laughs> Man, you know, also, you know, in reference to that, uh, that sign, you know, which is a good point because when we go to Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 12 and 20, yes, says, moreover, also, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. So they might know 
Uh, I want to highlight that word note in reference to the sign because we also see it in verse 20 as well where it says, and hallow my Sabbaths and they shall be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Now, how is it we know the Lord? Because many say they know the Lord. Well, it has to be based on this sign. So let's yeah. go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. And it verifies those that know the Lord. Because, you know, those that know the Lord, uh, they have the sign, which is the Sabbath. It says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3, 3 through 5. Because okay. those who have the sign know the <laughs> Lord, knowing that that sign is God's Sabbath. It says, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And we know that the Sabbath is, is that fourth commandment. It also says, he that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. We are in so we cannot know God if we're not keeping his Sabbath or honoring his sign that we might be sanctified. So to say we know him and not keep his commandments is just the opposite. And it puts us in that other category. Amen. And I add to that Matthew 7, verse 23, uh, on the word no, Christ says, okay. and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart Amen. From ye that work iniquity. Amen, Amen Brother Troy. Yes, I, yes. You know, there are many, there are many people who say that <clears throat> the Sabbath and the, and the commandments and the things in the Old Testament for the, were for the Jews. But when you read Galatians chapter 3, it says in here in verse 26, he says, for you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So Amen. when you look at these things, also... And, and you look at Romans chapter four, I believe it is, where it talks about Abraham believed God and it was accounted on him for righteousness. Everybody believes in Abraham. We believe that we are in Christ. We accept Christ as our savior. We call ourselves Christians. But yet, if I don't consider myself um, <clears throat> part of Abraham's seed, guess what? I can't see the kingdom of God. Amen. I mean, I just want to connect that to Matthew 5, uh, Matthew 5 and 19. Whosoever, okay. therefore, whosoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teach it, teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And, you know, Constantino, Constantine, I'm sorry, he changed a lot of stuff. He changed the days of the week because it was first the first day of the week, second day of the week. He changed those to the names. Uh, I think Monday is to the moon, Tuesday, um, I can't think of what Tuesday is, but Wednesday, all these were to gods. So he changed that. So it would make sense that he would go and change the Sabbath day to Sunday. So this is all done on the, the, the papacy, the Roman uh, Catholic Church. And, you know, it just makes sense that he would, he would change that and bring all these pagan holidays into the church that he would change the holy day of the week to Sunday. Amen. Amen. And, and you know, what, what, what Sister is saying is so true. And we've got to always remember that God has faithful people in the Catholic Church. God has people in every church, every denomination, and they're living up to the light of the gospel that has been shed across their pathway. They love Amen. God with all their heart. And when Jesus makes that call, come out of her, my people, these people are going to see the signs as uh, what's it? Revelation talks about. I saw an, an angel flying in the midst of heaven. Those angel means messengers. God is counting on us to carry this gospel to the world. And as we receive, as they receive this gospel, as they hear these truths that they've never heard before, the Sabbath is Saturday. When we go to the jail, we talk to people 
and they say, you know, that Sunday's the first day, the, the first, the second, seventh day of the week. Mm. I say, yeah, when you look at a, when you look at a business calendar, because they count the first day as Monday, but in yeah. God's calendar and God numbered the days, as she just said, man came along and named them. But we got to remember that God has faithful people in every church. And when you hear these things, it may be startling to you, but let, but you need to know that God loves you. And God is wanting you to know the whole truth. What's that verse? Paul says, I have not failed to give you all the counsel of God. Ministers are holding back because it's about a money thing. Not all, but some are holding back because they'll lose their congregants. And guess what? There goes their fund. There goes their means. Man, we want to remember. You know? We want to remember that God has faithful people in every church. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And uh, I just wanted to say real quick that, you know, um, if you look it up and, you know, and you go like Encyclopedia Britannica, all those things, you know, they, they tell you, it says that the Babylonians name each other days after one of the five planetary bodies known to them, like Mercury, Venus, Mars, <laughs> Jupiter, and Saturn, you know, and after the sun and the moon. And it says a, a costume later adopted by the Romans. So we know that definitely this name um, of the days of the week did not come, you know, from God or the Bible. It came from, you know, man. Yeah, from men. Amen. Amen. So, uh, so amen. now we see amen. that we have been given a message that is probably one of the most important messages ever been given to men, other than that, you know. Uh, the same we've been given the sanctuary message, the law of God, the spirit of prophecy, saints. The calling truly is a high calling, Amen. and uh, it's it's a very serious message, a very vital message, and we can understand why the devil would attack this message because it is the word of God and it is the gospel. Well, go ahead on, brother God, Josh. Uh, yeah, Brother Troy, I was going to um, connect this, um, connect it to a book from, La uh, it's called Last Day Events, yes. uh, page, page 123, paragraph 2. And this is in reference to, you know, the Sabbath and the, and the day being sanctified, where God rested on the seventh day as an example to man, to, to humankind. And it said, God made the world in six days. And rested on the seventh, sanctifying this day, and setting it apart from all others as holy to himself, to be observed by his people throughout their generations. But the man of sin, exalting himself above God, sitting in the temple of God, and showing himself to be God, thought to change times and laws. This power, thinking to prove that it was not only equal to God, but above God, changed the rest day placing the first day of the week where the seventh should be. And the Protestant world has taken this child of the papacy to be regarded as sacred. In the word of God, this is called a for fornication, according to Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. Amen. Let me read this uh, question here. We're going to move forward. We got about maybe two more questions, and this is about it. So we can finish it. It says this, uh, so what is, what is the worship of the beast? And I want to take this from Great Controversy 448 paragraph three. And this is in reference to Revelations 13, 15, right? Revelations 13, 15, in reference to that, we have power, and he had power uh, to give life unto the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So what is the worship of the uh, beast and his image? The enforcement of Sunday keeping on the part of Protestant churches is an enforcement of the worship of the papacy. Those who understanding the claims of the fourth commandment choose to observe the false instead of the true Sabbath are thereby paying homage to that power by which alone 
it is them uh, alone, it is themselves form and image to the beast. Hence, the enforcement of Sunday keeping in the United States would be an enforcement of the worship of the beast and his image. Great Controversy 448, paragraph three. And it says, what does it mean if we go to church? Uh, does it mean that if we go to church on Sunday, we have received the mark of the beast? Okay, somebody get Acts 1730. And I'm gonna read this from Great Controversy 449, paragraph one. Christians of past generations observe the Sunday, supposing that in so doing that they were keeping the Bible Sabbath. And there are now true Christians in every church, as Brother Brian was stating earlier, not expecting that the Roman Catholic com uh, communion, not accepting the Roman Catholic communion, who honestly believe that Sunday is the Sabbath of divine appointment. God accepts their sincerity of purpose and their integrity before, before, the, before him. So if you knowingly, which most of us on here do, if we knowingly began to keep Sunday over the Sabbath, we are paying homage to the beast, us because we knowingly know this. But, but now, if someone is doing this ignorantly, God will accept that worship. But he can't accept it, accept it from us because we know better and, and we have been given that light. And so God won't accept that worship from us. And by doing so, we'll really be receiving the mark of the beast early. Even before this has been decreed because we would knowingly have departed from the faith, right? Willfully keeping a day that God has not appointed uh, in his face. It's like throwing it in his face. So it will be a difference for uh, those who understanding and knowingly keep that day versus those who do not know and are honestly keeping a day that they thought was the biblical Sabbath. And so God, uh, in their ignorance, he winks at it. But now he's commanded that this message go forth because he's calling that all men repent. So when will the Lord hold a person accountable for Sunday worship? And this is from Great Controversy 449, paragraph one. When Sunday observance shall be enforced by law, remember that decree we read for in uh, Zephaniah and Brother uh, Williams, how he was highlighting in Jonah, the decree, a law that went forth that no, uh, that the animals shouldn't eat, the men shouldn't eat. Uh, there was a fast declared because of a prophecy that Jonah had, had given, that the Lord told him to give. Though. Okay, it says, when Sunday observance shall be enforced by law, and the, whole, and the world shall be enlightened, that's the key, remember, knowingly concerning the obligations of the true Sabbath. This is why we have to get the true gospel out versus the spurious one because uh, their blood will be on us. Then whoever shall transgress the command of God to obey a precept which has no higher authority than that of Rome, with thereby honor popery above God, he is paying homage to Rome and to the power which enforces the institution ordained by Rome. He is worshiping the beast and his image as men then reject the institution which God has declared to be the sign of his authority. And that's been thoroughly highlighted today. And honor in its stead, that which Rome has chosen as a token of her supremacy, they will thereby accept the sign of allegiance to Rome, the mark of the beast. It is not until the issue is thus plainly set before the people and they are brought to choose between the commandments of God and the commandments of men that those 
who continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. So we see, again, God is given that choice. Choose you this day whom we will serve. So what are the threats made to those who refuse the mark of the beast? Uh, Great Controversy 604, paragraph 2, connecting this to uh, Revelations 13, 15, and 17. Fearful is the issue to which the world is to be brought. The powers of earth uniting to war against the commandments of God will decree, there's that word again, decree, that all, both small and great, rich and poor. Now, we can connect that decree to, as my brother was highlighting, cause it, right? Command, a law is given, right? Cause it both, right? So there's a decree that all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, as Revelations 13, 16, shall conform, conform to the customs of the church by the observance of the false Sabbath. All who refuse compliance will be visited with civil penalties, and it will finally be declared that they are deserving of death. On the other hand, the law of God in joining the Creator's rest day demands obedience and threatens wrath against all who transgress its precepts. You remember when Christ said, why fear men who can only destroy the body and afterwards can do you no more harm? Well, that's what we're faced with. We're caught between the flood of evil men and the commandments of God. Now, who are you going to obey? Obey. Yeah, this is what we're faced with. We're, as they say, a rock in a hard place? Uh, I don't know. But I know we have to choose between who we're going to obey. And I say, I say that since man can't really offer you anything but a lot of talk, we should go with the Lord, which made heaven and earth to see and all that in them is. In closing, let us uh, consider the following. Great Controversy, 605, paragraph 2. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth especially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction between will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve him not, Malachi. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law, uh, uh, with the law, the state, uh, law of God, and those who, wait a minute. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of God, with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be a vow of allegiance to the power that is in opposition to God. The keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receive the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receive the seal of God. So, I say this, what would you rather be? A prince of men or a prince of God? We make the choice. Just like men are selling their souls for golden statues and and trinkets that are moth-eaten and rusted and cankered, God has promised to give us a crown of eternal life. So who, who do we choose? Do we want the rust and the canker? Because that's what that gold and that silver is. It's rusted and cankered already. You know why? Because the word of God says so, and his word never fails. It never returns unto him void. That's what faith is. Faith is... Believe in God's word, even though you can't see it, right? And it comes by hearing the word of God. See, that's how the world will form, by the word of God. And why do we have faith and how does it work within us? By God's love, because he loved us so much that if we believe in his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. That's God's word. So we can believe man's word, which ain't worth nothing, right? We know. Let every man be a liar. If we choose to obey man, we're going to die. 
I'm going to tell you that right now. We're going to die if we choose to obey and listen to men lie to us. Or we can believe God's word and we will have life eternal. So the choice is ours. Do we want to be prince of men or prince of God? Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word. We shall not return unto us void. Lord, we can stand on it. It's a sure foundation. And so, Lord, we ask that you be with every family represented here tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for an opportunity to come together and to share with one another. I certainly learned something tonight, Heavenly Father, and I just thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy shown to us. Lord, help us to be faithful. And we want to be with you. Lord, we thank you for your blessed Sabbath day, which you've allowed us to live and see. It's been a beautiful day today, Lord. We just thank you today for your holy Sabbath and for all those who understand this great sign that you've given us that we are your people. Lord, bless us to be faithful. I'm learning that whatever we need, Lord, we can ask you. So, Lord, thank you for hearing and answering our prayers while the door of mercy is yet open. We just want to just, Lord, we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters. Amen.